I blame the heat for everything. It's 91 degrees Fahrenheit here. I don't know Celsius yet, even though I've lived here a year. I know that 20 is nice. 21, somewhere in there is around 70. I don't, I don't know what 90, 91 is, but it's been hot here all week. And I've been staying offline. I haven't watched hardly anybody's channels, so I feel a bit guilty about that. I hope you're all doing well. But I thought since it's been a while, I should at least get on here and do a um, weekly update update on my 100 book challenge and where I'm at on the various challenges. I'm still plugging away at Westerns, not nearly at the speed I was at uh, before, but I did read one this week. Let me get to my photos here. Uh, maybe one and a half, depending on how we count. We'll get to that. I read this book. Edge number one, this will be familiar to people, I think, a lot of people. Number one, The Loner. Um, this one doesn't say it, but a, lo a lot of the covers, uh, you know, make a point of saying how violent it is, one of the most violent Western series. So I was looking forward to that. It's the only one I have, so I was worried that if I, if I liked it, it would make it tough to finish my 100 book challenge of reading only what I own or not spending any money at least until I until I finish a hundred books that I've got but it wasn't that great I didn't like it that much um, let me let me backtrack a little bit it's by the end I really liked it it really picks up in the last 25 percent <clears throat> and it is his first novel his first western it's the first in this series this this edition has a forward in it. It's the regular Kindle edition. I think they're three fifty a piece, three dollars fifty cents a piece. And you know he's a lot of these older writers who wrote uh, a lot uh, really like to make a big point about how unprepared they were and, and how little thought they went gave in, into stuff. Uh, I, I'm sorry I'm sounding irritated. I can real, I realize, I'll try and back off. I, I realize I'm kind of uh, in a grumpy mood because uh, of the heat and everything. But he makes a big point of, of letting you know, letting the reader know that he had never read a Western, let alone written one, before he got the contract for this series. Um, so that's a little bit of a humble brag, I think. It's pretty good considering he never written one before. I think they probably get I just have a feeling they get better because people... Love the people who love like good trashy stuff like this and good adventure action adventure stuff really do like them. So I'm guessing maybe, what do you think? Around number five or number ten, they really still they really kick into view. I, is there a hundred of them? I forget. I, I I forget. I don't want to look it up again, but I know there's at least sixty or seventy of them. Plus he has other series too, and he is a good writer. And like I say, it does pick up towards the end. Pretty sure I have the feeling, based on the titles of some of the others and things, that the character Edge, the main character, is not going to end up, not going to continue right where he's left at the end of of this book. It would be a pretty boring uh, series if it did. So we'll see. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, and people will jump in and say, you know, no, that's as good as they get. But I don't know. I don't know. I might read some at another time. I'm not. Uh, turn off enough that I would say forget this right or anything but I, I just thought it was a little slower and, and um, less involving th than I would have thought then I read well I'm still working on this the Spanish version of how to uh, gain friends and influence people um, I, but I'm over uh, halfway done so I'm pretty sure I'll finish it it's interesting enough uh, you know, as I said in one of my other videos, I might have even mentioned this one before. They, they take me long. I read like maybe, you know, one chapter a night or, you know, probably I read about like a tenth or a twentieth of my normal reading speed on something like this. But it is, if, if you want to study a foreign language and you want to get into reading and you can find sort of pop, pop business books or pop psychology books or diet books, exercise books, that kind of stuff, they're usually pretty easy because you'll understand a lot of the concepts already and that helps you get along with the reading. Anyway, so I'm still working on that, but I'm going to count it. I read a couple of uh, sort of dumb 
Um, see, I'm just being rude for no reason. These these books are pretty interesting. This is one by Ryan Holiday, who's this big Stoic guy in line. He's always talking about the Stoics, but he is actually a pretty good writer. This is called Perennial Seller. I thought it was about bestsellers. Um, meaning uh, books that have sold a lot for a long time. There's a good blog I used to read by Rick Horton, Rich Horton, called Old Bestsellers, uh, where he would review. I'll put a link to this. Uh, I think he's still doing it. He, Rich, Rich Horton is a, a an editor, reviewer in the science fiction community, but also he does all kind of other books. He has a, a, a blog, which is really fun to read, where he reads, he'll read like random old bestsellers from the 1890s or that 1920s. I'm going to pause so that I can remember to write this down. I really want to put it in the comments since I'm talking about it. Okay, I think it's, uh, I think the name of the blog is Strange at Ectobon, uh, sort of inspired by the novel of an old, by the title of an old Michael Bishop novel, I think. Um, <clears throat> but it, he's, it's a great blog by Rich Horton. And it's, if you like to read about old ephemera and stuff that people don't remember, and, and he's, he's a pretty good reviewer. Uh, so, but anyway, that's not what this is about. I mean, it's it's some of that. It talks about things like to kill a, to kill a mockingbird or whatever else. It's really about products that are, that are of high quality that sell uh, year after year after year, as opposed to the next big thing. You know, and we know all that about, you know, things that come on the bestseller list. And you look at last year's bestseller list or five years ago's bestseller list. And 99% of the things on that are totally forgotten. Whereas some other book like, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird or Ulysses, which I know some of you guys are reading right now. Um, you know, they sell constantly, you know, and these are allegedly difficult books. Uh, you know, but but they but they have something that brings people back to them generation after generation. So it was interesting stuff. And then Stephen Pressfield, he writes these artist books. You know, these famous book, uh, The War of Art. It's all about procrastination and things like that. This one's kind of just the same stuff rehashed, uh, but it's pretty short. So it's really exactly the same stuff rehashed. If you see these uh, Stephen Pressfield books. Just read The War of Art. The rest are all the same. You just keep coming out with a new one, the same stuff again. And they're okay. And I read... Oh, boy. I know I've complained about Stephen King before. I said he was overrated in one time. And I do, but I do like a lot of his earlier stuff. And I, do, I have liked his stuff intermittently. And I've hung on longest to the shorter pieces. I think that's really where his strength is. You know, people know, of course, Stand By Me, and which was based on The Body, his novella The Body. His first book of novellas, uh, Different Seasons, uh, has three great ones in it. It has The Body, it has the one about uh, Apt Pupil, A-P-T, Apt Pupil, which made it into a movie with Ian McKellen about a, weird-ass creepy kid in the suburbs somewhere who, who uh, realizes that one of his neighbors is an old uh, Nazi hiding out and he's the, and the kid is just as big a creep as the Nazi so he's probably about the worst person who could find this out this information and what's the other one from that uh, oh and uh, and um, Shawshank Redemption. So right there in that one book, you've got two of Stephen King's most timeless stories, Shawshank Redemption, which is called Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption, I believe, and <clears throat> The Body, which was made into Stand By Me. And those are two of his most enduring stories because people just so happen to make them into good films, you know, along with Misery and some of the other films that people really, you know, carry. The, the first version of Carrie and... The Shining, even though Stephen King doesn't like The Shining. So a lot of those live on because of the movies, but the books are good too. So I've always kept up with his short stuff. His last collection of novellas was If It Bleeds, and that was the first novella collection that I, I couldn't finish. And I think they were kind of related to each other, the stories, and I just lost interest in it. Now this comes out, this is shorter stories, and it has a novella or two in it. 
And I think this is going to be my last one, guys. I just He just doesn't do it for me. I think there's one story in here I liked about an old man, a uh, creepy old man. I um, can't think of the title right now. And I don't want to say too much about it because it'll spoil the story, but it seems it's probably one of the older stories in the book or one of the ones he found a fragment of and, and rewrote. A couple of the longer stories I, I didn't finish. There was another story I thought was okay. It completely eludes me now. So anyway, I did read... Almost, I did start all the, at least all the stories, and I finished, I think, all but two of them. But he's just not for me anymore. So you won't have to put up with any more Stephen King whining on my channel because I'm not going to bother anymore. Okay, but speaking of, and this is probably a, a bad, a bad um, timing on my part because I also read... The total opposite of Stephen King in terms of massive bestsellers, this writer, who's fantastic. Just everything is fantastic. Of course, he only managed to write six books in, in 30 years, but there's something to be said for that. I mean, his books are so thoughtful and dense and worked out, and it's not just sort of like... Uh, you're not like reading an improv. So right now I'm reading... Let me go back here. Uh, I'm currently in the middle of this one, the one after Silence of the Lambs. I read Silence of the Lambs. I'm going to finish this tonight. It just got too late and I fell asleep last night. These books are so well written. Okay, but to cover Silence of the Lambs, i got to go back to Red Dragon. And this kind of surprised me that... And this is probably a, a hot take or an unpopular opinion or a quirky take or just I'm out of my mind. But I liked Red Dragon better than Silence of the Lambs. I really did. So I was slightly disappointed in parts of Silence of the Lambs because I knew the story well and it's pretty faithful. The movie is pretty faithful. What sort of... What I didn't like as much was... Uh, Clary Starling. I just didn't really... And she's fine. I mean, she's a good character and and I can see why people relate to that character. And it was just something about the, the backstory, the silence of the lamb stuff, the acts of the stuff that leads into this metaphor. I just felt... and. And I think in the movie, for example, Jodie Foster sold it really well. I thought I liked Jodie Foster in the movie playing Clary Starling uh, more than I liked Clary Starling in the book. Not that you have to like her to follow the story, but just that particular aspect of the book, her memories that she has to share with, with Hannibal Lecter, and which he says he'll know if she's lying and she's telling the truth and these trauma they just to me they felt so contrived and writerly it was the only time i felt like the hand of the author like making stuff up you know everything else seems so real and these books are so absurd you know and they get more absurd as they go on cuz cuz tom Harris has to keep topping himself you know it this is practically and I don't mean this as an insult, but when you get into Hannibal, this is, you know, comic book era. era. This is like big, over-the-top pulp stuff, these absurd, larger-than-life characters um, like uh, Vernon Mason, the, the, the evil person. You know, he has to keep, uh, Harris has to keep making uh, uh, Hannibal's enemies more evil because ha Hannibal's so despicably evil that, the, of course, the people who are opposing him, you know, in order to uh, to make any sense at all, have to be even worse. So uh, uh, Mason, Ver, Virgil, Vernon Mason is just even, just like the most awful person who deserved every horrible thing that Hannibal did to him. Um, you know, this story is pretty well known to me now, too, but uh, I like it better than Science of the Lambs, too. And... 
we'll have to see when I finish it because I know I've had the ending of the, this all this stuff spelled for me a long time ago and originally I didn't even think I would want to read Hannibal because because of how Clarice Starling is treated and changed by the end of that book. Uh, but now, after reading Sons of the Lamb, I don't care that much because I'm not as invested in, in her as a character as I was in the way Jodie Foster played it in the movie, which was excellent. And I just feel like it's not as well delineated in the novel. And maybe I just expected so much more than Red Dragon. I thought... I thought Red, Red Dragon was really great. I also think Sons of the Lamb was really great, but I have to be honest and say that of the three books I've read so far, uh, Sons of the Lamb is my least favorite. So Hannibal um, goes in both directions. It goes back more into the history of Hannibal Lecter, plus carries the story, story forward. It's a very ambitious book. Uh, he works very hard. Now I understand why you know he, he writes a book like every five or six years, or might have even been longer. Uh, you know, trying to top himself, which must be impossible to do. So I really like those books. But in in the and you know Hannibal. In fact, as as Stephen King says in a quote in the in the front of my copy of Hannibal, uh, this is definitely a horror novel. This is it's got the gloss a little bit of a of a. Uh, police thriller still because you know so many of the characters are in the FBI and that kind of thing and Hannibal's a fugitive and from the FBI but it's really just a gothic a modern gothic horror novel it's got you know part of it's set in Venice and, and you know it's very creepy and very well done so he does kind of switch genres there and you know it's really not fair to uh, compare other books to that because he does it so well Last book that I read, I started, and this is what I meant earlier when I said, you know, maybe half of, half, one and a half Westerns. Finally started Wrath of the, of the Summer of Trek, The Return of the Wrath of the Summer of Star Trek, whatever they're calling it, with this book, Ishmael, a novel by Barbara Hamley, Star Trek. You can see Spock there in an old-timey saloon. Are they playing chess? I think they are playing chess. I thought it was originally, I mean, they're playing chess in the book. Spock is um, by the end pretty good uh, kind of like Edge I like ha about halfway through I was thinking looks sort of like Nurse Chapel there but it isn't like Major Barrett uh, Major Barrett Runberry playing uh, Nurse Chapel but it's not she's not even mentioned in the novel neither is Scotty I don't think it was written in 1985. It's very much an old school Star Trek novel, meaning pre movies. Well, the movie, first movie came out in 80, 79, right? The motion picture. And then Wrath of Khan came out in 82 or 81 or something, 82. This book came out in 85, but it's still really pretty much based on the series, so it has the the timeline or tradition of having Sulu and Chekhov and Uhura doing absolutely nothing except sitting at their com, you know, sitting at their work uh, stations and saying, you know, engines, whatever, hailing frequencies open, the kind of stuff. Well, I, Uhura has a little bit more of a scene than that. And the book's mostly Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Kirk, Spock, McCoy. Which is fine, because those are the characters, you know, and that's how they used to write the, this kind of series. It was not an ensemble series like the later series are. And I think people tend to forget that, or people who were raised on the later series first tend to forget that um, and see it as a criticism. But no, that's just how television was back then. You know, you had a couple main characters. Uh, you had a, a sidekick, and you had, you know, people who were just around the edges who might get a story once in a great while. Um, she does a few other weird things here, like she calls uh, uh, the planet Vulcan Vulcania, which I've only heard in really early first season episodes. I don't know if she's thinking of it as an alternate name for Vulcan or... So anyway, and I, a lot of these things that are done in this book I've seen repeated in other things. That's why I have to uh, bear in mind... And, 
and keep saying that this was written in 1985, but uh, first thing that's often repeated, and this might be the first book to do it, is it's another City on the Edge of Forever sequel. You know, they go back to the Guardian of Forever and uh, somehow get thrown out in time. And in this book, somewhat like the next gen the second Next Generation movie, uh, Star Trek First Contact, in which the Borg goes back to Earth's past to try and defeat Earth by destroying the Empire, the Klingons go back to Earth's, Earth's past to try and uh, give themselves a better position in in modern times. I really like the opening that it starts out, uh, Kirk is already stressed out because Spock is missing, presumed dead. It's just the first page, it's not really a spoiler. He... Uh, Turns out he's actually thrown back in time. He sends a message through. It's a cryptic message, not as cryptic as they're trying to make it. All the star, all the Enterprise stuff in this book is is Kirk and McCoy like looking through old microfilm, trying to figure out what the mysterious numbers eighteen sixty seven could possibly mean. Okay, so uh, anyway, so spoiler alert: Spock is trapped in eighteen sixty seven. And he has amnesia because, of course, he has amnesia. So that's a way to get around the fact that if you know if he were back there by himself, he would know not to interfere with anything. But he has uh, amnesia, and so he doesn't know not to fear, uh, interfere with everything. And very oddly, this guy who he meets, this main character here, and it's in, set in Seattle in, during the during the gold rush era the of you know um, you know it's really involved in in this family that he gets involved with this guy who he gets involved with immediately guesses he's an alien from another planet you know not just the guy with weird ears remember spock doesn't remember anything He's got amnesia. He speaks English. He's got pointy eyebrows and pointy ears. You know, he looks basically human. I mean, if you if you didn't know, if you'd never seen Star Trek and you'd never heard of Vulcans, and you saw a guy that looked like that, you wouldn't go, oh, there's a guy from another planet. He looks so different from us. You'd think there's a person with a birth defect, or if you're superstitious, you might think there's a demon or a ghost or something, or just something creepy about him. But... And uh, you know, and Spock's like, yeah, I am from another. One of us is from another planet. It must it's either me or you. And you know, this is when he first meets him before they show him around. So they give him a disguise. They give him a name. He starts living there. He ends up living there like four months. It's and it's basically a story about him helping these folks along. So it's similar to, uh, you know, you have to wonder how many Star Trek scriptwriters later on were looking through these old books and came up with ideas. It's it's a bit similar to that great episode of Enterprise where T'Pol tells a story about her own mother and the time she crash landed on Earth in the 1950s. Her, so these three, it's one of my favorite episodes of Enterprise where these three um, aliens, I mean, these three Vulcans crash land on Earth and they have to integrate for a while. And, uh, you know, somebody could have been inspired by this, this novel by Barbara Hambly to do that too. You know, maybe they were inspired to have the Borg go back in time by having the Klingons go back in time. Um, then she kind of uh, saves herself about three quarters of the way through. She starts having Kirk and Spock for some reason start wondering about whether there was anybody on Earth who would possibly guessed that Spock was an alien and not a demon or a deformed person or just a strange looking person. You know, they think, oh no, nobody would think that. Well, one, one person might think it and there's no reason for them to even start thinking about this kind of stuff because they're not on the planet. They don't know where Spock is yet. <coughs> it's just kind of trying to hand wave away the ridiculousness of, of, this, of this character being so sure that, that Spock is a... Uh, is an extraterrestrial, even though they have no kind of technology. And then it's and then they they kind of uh, 
save it another way too, which uh, shows that this person is kind of might have encountered extraterrestrials before, but not in a way that I really bought it. So, uh, but it is it was a, pr a fairly decent novel. It's really Spock having adventure on a planet where we don't know he's Spock and he doesn't know he's Spock, where he gets to help out these people. Just knowing he's different, you know, he gets to help them out, you know, by playing chess in a, uh, to, to help them with their finances. And when one of the brothers in his family screws up and loses all their money playing poker and he helps, you know, and, and then not falling in love with a, a, a human woman because he knows it's wrong for some reason. And he um, and that stuff's pretty good. Um, even though you know Spock's history in the series is pretty well established that he's attracted to human women as as much and if not more than Vulcan women. So I don't know why he would uh, not feel that way just because he lost his memories. Anyway, I'm getting too deep into it. It's just a fun novel. You know, it was better written than most of the Star Trek novels I've written. It's not surprising that Barbara Hamley got onto this big career doing all kinds of uh, her own books and stuff. So those are my books, um, which means I read one, two, three, four, five, eight. Wow. Well, like I said, I'm, I'm not quite through Hannibal, but... I'll finish it tonight. I know I'll finish um, How to Win Friends. and So I'm at 60 of my 100 book challenge to read 100 books before I buy any new ones. These books on my Kindle or books that I've already got on hold from the library. And that was The uh, uh, Science of the Lambs and Hannibal, which I got from the library. And Science of the Lambs, Sons of the Lamb's a long wait. They should buy more copies of that. It's still a very popular book. The others you don't have to wait for very long, if at all. That's where I'm at. Have a good Friday. Thank you all for hanging with me. Or uh, if you're just happy that I don't post as much anymore, you're welcome. I'm looking forward to hearing what you're all doing, and we'll talk soon.